Good morning. Welcome to Fox Valley Christian Church, where every member is a missionary, or as we say, you are a missionary. I just want to give you guys a reminder uh, that next week is our fifth Sunday takeover. Uh, Our children's ministry is coming in, and they are taking over everything in here, Uh, like every aspect of the worship service uh, they're going to be involved in. They're going to be taking over. Uh, Personally, I am super excited for it. Uh, I've seen the work that's gone into it, the preparing, the preparation, all those things. So so that's exciting. Uh, What I want to remind you guys, though, is that you guys have a part of preparation for that service. So next week, uh, when we uh, pass the offering, uh, we'll pass just our normal offering. You'll know because it'll look like normal. Uh, and then we'll have another one where they're passing cans. Those cans is a noisy offering, uh, which means find the loudest coins you can find. Uh, And we're going to just be filling them up with coins. Uh, Those go to the Samaritan's Purse, which uh, our children's ministry every year, uh, our kids bring in an offering, and uh, they have like a target and a focus and what their offering is going towards. Uh, And this year, uh, their offering is going towards Samaritan's Purse. So this is really our way of helping them out uh, as they are trying to uh, to reach their offering and have a little bit of fun and make it noisy. So uh, bring coins. That's how you can... Uh, prepare for next week, and also just prepare yourself for something different. Uh, Different uh, is actually quite a good thing because we all have different learning styles, right? Some of you, uh, it's great if somebody stands in front of you and rambles for about 30 minutes. Uh, For some of you, you're going to learn in a completely different style that's that's fine. That's great. So uh, so difference difference great. I'm excited about I'm excited about next week. So before we jump into this, though, let's let's pray. God, we love you. Uh, God, we do. God, we just thank you. Uh, God, we thank you for your word. Uh, We thank you that every week we can open up your word uh, and we can just get to know you more. Uh, And that is our prayer today. God, our prayer above everything else is that when we we leave here, God, we know you just a little bit more. Uh, God, and we just uh, we just pray that we can continue to do that. Uh, We just uh, we just love you so much. And we just pray in your son's name. Uh, We pray in Jesus name. Amen. So we are uh, finishing off our sermon series today uh, on the parables. Uh, we're going to be stepping into the last parable that we're going to be looking at, and it is, I told you last week, it is a very, very, very uh, familiar parable that we are stepping into. Uh, but as we step into this parable, uh, our goal is to, uh, well, I'd say our goal is to answer a simple question. Maybe the better way to say it is our goal is to begin to answer a simple question or give a part of an answer to a simple question. And that question is, what is God really like? What is God really like? Or, you know, another way to say it is, is who is God, right? Now, there is no way over the next handful of, you know, minutes that we have together that I'm going to be able to fully tell you in every way who God is or tell you the, all the aspects of what he is like. So today you're just going to get a glimpse. Now, some people would say that the greatest question that a person can answer is, do you believe in God? That is, that is the greatest answer that a person uh, can answer is, do you believe in God? And I would almost argue that a greater question is, do you know God? Do you know God? Because it's one thing to be an atheist and to say, well, I don't believe in God, right? That's a uh, in my opinion, a sorrowful stance to have, uh, and it is a, uh, it's a broken-hearted life to live, right, to stand there from that point of view, but I, w- I would almost argue that it's worse to believe in God and not know him, o- or to believe in God and know him wrongly. So when we look and we say, okay, so who is God? What is God really like? Is God a God of terror that demands his people to hijack planes to kill innocent people, to go to the extremes and sacrifice their lives in in an effort to take as many of them with yourself as you possibly can? Is that what God's like? Is God, as the deists believe, is he impersonal? Did he create the world and then he's just like, have fun, enjoy right? If it goes amok, that's on you. I really don't care. I created and I'm stepping away. Is, is that what God's really like? Is God just one God among many other gods? And then are all those coexist signs right and 
all the gods would just live in harmony, then we'd be fine. Is God, as New Age religion would lead us to believe, just a life force, just in everything, in every tree, in every crystal, in every person, which then leads us to worship trees and crystals and even ourselves. And we become God because we can attain to it, because God who just exists in everything, he's in us too. Is that what God's really like? So what is God like? Who is he? Because, I mean, we can answer the question, do you believe in God? Yes, I believe in God. But then we can have a totally different direction that we are heading in based on what we believe about God and who he is. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this parable, and we're going to get a glimpse. I mean, that is the best I can offer you is a glimpse today. But I do, I do, I do want to pause here really quick because this is a good opportunity for this, just to give you an idea of, of what's coming next, right? So we said the next week uh, that we are uh, have our fifth Sunday takeover, and, and that's going to be awesome, so be here. Uh, but then after that, uh, we're going to step into a series where we are looking at the authority of Scripture. We are going to look at what God left for us, and that's his word. And we're going to say, okay, does Scripture have authority? And if so, what does that mean for our lives? So we're going to spend a few weeks looking at the word of God and, and, and the authority of Scripture in, in, in that it's valid and that it's true and what that means for our lives. Then what we're going to do is we lead up to Christmas. We are going to look at the nature of Christ, right? We're going to look at the nature of Jesus. We're going to say, who is he? And what does that mean for our lives? Then we're going to start the new year by looking at the work of the church. If we are God's body and we are supposed to be on mission for him, if every member is a missionary, then what does that look like? How are we really supposed to be living right now in this world in these times? And we're going to look at the work of the church. And I mean, just to be, just to be real with you, when we start that in January, the world might feel a little bit different for each one of us, depending on what happens right in November. We're going to start January with certain feelings, and I think looking at the work of the church is one of the most important things that we can do at that time period. So we're going to say, God, how have you called us to live in this world at this time? What can we be doing for your glory? And then we're going to step out of that, and we're going to look in the nature of God. So this is going to be late winter, early spring. What we are going to give you a glimpse of today, then we're going to dig deeper, and we're going to say, okay, God, who are you? And how can we know you more? And then we're going to step out of that, and leading up to Easter, we're going to look at the work of Christ. Not just who is Jesus, but, 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 but what, what does his presence actually mean? What is the work that he did? What did that accomplish for us? And then we will leave that, and we will finish off this little journey that we're taking. And we are going to look at the Holy Spirit, and we're going to look at the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives now, and what that means to live as the empowered body of Christ. So that's our, that's our little journey. But today... Today, we're just going to get a little glimpse. So as we step into this parable, remember we say context matters. Uh, we've actually gone through the context of, of what's happening in this parable. So just a really quick refresher. Uh, in Luke 15, we have Jesus at a dinner at a religious leader's house. The reason we've gone through this is because there's several parables that come out in this dinner. And as he's at this dinner, he's teaching them. He has some pretty hard words for them that he's using parables to describe. And, and remember, there's this dinner with all these important people, and then you have the everybody else, or as they would call it that time, the sinners, that were all on the outside of the house, and they're watching and they're listening, right, to what is going on in this dinner, and they're drawing near and drawing near and drawing near, because Jesus actually turns and addresses them. And as he addresses them, they draw so near to him that the religious leaders say in Luke 15 too, this man receives sinners and eats with him. This isn't a prophet. This isn't a rabbi. This isn't a religious leader. Look at this fool. That's what they're saying. He receives sinners and he eats with them. He might as well just be one of them is how they're pointing at him. Their holiness has to be so much greater than his. And then what Jesus does is he steps into three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. And today we're going to look at the third one of those. We're going to look at the prodigal son, right? But really, a better way to say it, today we're going to look at the prodigal son's father. So Luke 15, 11 says this. It says, And he, Jesus, said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. Great start, right? Great start to this story. We have a younger son who just blatantly demands his inheritance, 
right? Like, Dad, I know you're still alive, but I want what is coming to me when you die, and I want it now. Now, at that time, the older son would get two-thirds, and the younger son would get one-third if you had two sons. So that's what he's asking for. He's saying, Dad, just simple ask. I'd like you to give me one-third of everything you have, and I'd like it right now. And really, the, the son, like, he, he disappears. He disappears if he leaves, and he leaves when he gets what he wants. He leaves knowing, well, I consider you dead, and I will not see you again. I'm out. I know this was grievous. I know this was an attack. I know I offended you, and I'm out of here. Which kind of leads to what we don't see here, right? As we read through this parable, if we're focusing on the father, as we read through this parable, what we're going to get is we're going to get the father's reaction when the son comes back. We don't actually get the father's reaction when the son leaves. We don't get that. We, we, we don't get the emotional uh, 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 stance that the father's in. Now, we can look at the end of the story, and we can maybe assume how the father feels at the beginning here, but we don't get that feeling there. We could take our own emotions, and we could say, this is how I would feel, right? Let me tell you how this would go down. We get the response of the father, we get the, the, the fact that the father says, okay, here's your one-third, now go. That's, that is extremely telling about the father, but we don't actually get the feelings involved in it. And what I want to point out here about the nature of God is that God allows rebellion. He grants free will, even if it hurts him. He allows rebellion. He allows us to go against him. He gives free will. When the son says, give me my one-third now, he says, if that's what you want. If that's what you want, sure. I'll allow it. I'll give you the freedom to make that choice. If you want to go against everything that I have taught you your entire life, and you want to make that decision, I'll grant it, even if it hurts. In the beginning, God allowed Adam and Eve to choose to obey him or not. Free will, very beginning, right? You could choose to be with me. You could choose to obey me. And I'll only give you one really simple command to follow. But if you want to choose to go against me, I'll allow it, God says. He gives free will even when it hurts. In Deuteronomy, we see Moses lay out God's will. And then he says this in Deuteronomy 30, 19. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today, talking to the people that have just heard God's will. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Like this is a no-brainer in his opinion. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. And I've laid out the law for you. I have laid out what God is calling for your life, but you still have to choose. Choose life or choose death. Choose blessing or choose curse. God gives you the freedom to choose. And he gives you the freedom to choose wrong, even when it hurts him. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul says, No temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. You see that choice there, right? God is faithful. He doesn't say, God is faithful. Therefore, when you're tempted, he will take away temptation so that you don't sin. He will make sure that you never choose to go against him. No, he says God is faithful, and even when you're tempted, he will make sure that you always have the ability to choose him. You have free will. You will not be forced to obey him, but you cannot be forced to go against him. He will give you free will, and he will retain your free will. He will make sure that there is nothing that is too strong and too powerful and too overbearing so that you have to choose to go against him, so that you have to do what's wrong, so that you have to live in sin. He says, I will always make sure that your free will is your choice. Will you go against me or will you be for me? And even when it hurts, he gives us free will. Now, I see even when it hurts, but we don't actually see the father's feeling here. 
But I would tell you in the time, context of Scripture that God is grieved and he is angry. He is grieved and he is angry. Parents, you get that? I get that. There are times my kids, they make me sad and mad at the exact same time. They break me in multiple different ways, right? My dad says, I don't know if I want to hug you or slug you, right? Grieved and angry. Grieved and angry. Our heart hurts and we are also angry. L listen to this in the context of God. Genesis 6, 5 to 7. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That all he wanted to do was go against God's will. And the Lord regretted uh, that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Grieved. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. He is grieved and he is angry because he is love and he is just. He is grieved and he is angry and that's what it looks like to have that emotion for your creation. That's what it looks like to have that emotion for your sons and your daughters. And he's grieved and he's angry because God loves every one of us. That's why. That's why. When, 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 I, when I watch the news and I hear about a child being murdered, let me tell you, I am grieved and I am angry. But if I were to express to you right now when I see something like that, why am I grieved and why am I angry in that specific instance? I am grieved for the child. I am grieved for their parents. I am angry at the person that did it, right? I'm angry at the action that they chose. Like, that's where that emotion comes in. But, but God, who created everybody and loves everybody, he's also grieved for the offender, He's grieved that, that, that they would make that choice. He's grieved for the things in their life that led them to that point. His heart hurts for them. Maybe a different view that, that maybe you can understand is when I, when I look at the choice that somebody makes to abort a baby, I am grieved and I am angry. I'm angry because I don't believe we should ever kill one of God's creations. I don't believe that, that God wants us to go and, and kill his creation. I don't believe that God wants us to kill his innocent creation. I absolutely do not believe when I read through the word of God that God wants us to kill his creation in process. Literally taking the work of the creator while he's creating it and destroying it, I, I think is one of the most heinous things we can do. And it angers me. God gives us the free will choice to do it. But it grieves me. It grieves me for the life that never existed. But it grieves me for the parent that chose to do it. Because I know. I know the after effects. I've talked to enough people. I've seen enough hurting. I've seen young people go through it and the way they feel afterwards. I mean, that's why I'm always so careful when I talk about it and to bring it up because I know there's people in this room that might still be grieving choices that were made. And that hurts my heart for you. God is grieved on both sides and he's angered when these things happen. Luke 15, 14 to 20. And when he'd spent everything, a severe sa <laughs> salmon, a severe salmon <laughs> different story. Uh, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Things didn't go well for this young man. Go figure. Go figure. 
when we have an all-knowing God, when we have an all-knowing God who loves us. He loves us. He's all-knowing. He knows what's best, and he loves us. And then he is the one who directs and guides us and teaches us and tells us the way in which we should go. When we go against that, it's not going to go well for us. There might be times that we think it does. I'm sure when he had pockets full of cash that he thought, man, life is going well for me. But the Bible tells us that he squandered it, right? I think there was six words, squandered his property and reckless living. Well, that's, that's something, right? He had all of this with a pocket full of money, and we can assume, right, all of the different ways that he chose to go against the way he had been taught, the way that he had been raised, the way his father said, go in this way and it'll be good for you. And he just squandered it. Completely reckless living and he ends up in a pig pen slopping hogs wishing he was eating what they were eating. Go figure. And Jesus says there was a moment that he came to his senses. He realized, man, it'd be so much better. And then we see this awesome thing, right? This is the reason this story is so loved. Uh, There's this song when I was a kid, and this song this whole week has just been going through my head, but it's like a 90s song, so I'm not going to sing it to you because it's got a very 90s feel to it. Um, But it was When God Ran. I don't know if anybody remembers that song at all, right? But it's like, I saw him. No, I'm not going to sing it. I'll say it. I saw him run to me, right? It's really hard to say it and not sing it, you know? I saw him run to me, right? He took me in his arms, held my head to his chest, said, my son's come home again. Oh, just the the imagery of that and and what that looks like. Every time I'd hear that song, it would just move me. And the guy that sung it at our church uh, did not have the greatest voice, but boy, was his heart the biggest heart I'd ever seen. And when he sang it, I felt every single one of those words. Like, it just moved me seeing God like that. But context, 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 right? Because for us, sometimes we read through this parable and we're like, yeah, that makes sense. It makes sense that the father did that. But see, what we have found, right? Praise God for history. What we have found is that at that time, the religious leaders, they told a story just like this, right? And not just like at that time, predating Christ, we have records of a story that the religious leaders would teach. And the story that the religious leaders would teach would be about this son. And this son that went to his father and said, Father, give me your inheritance now. I don't want to wait. And then he'd go off and he'd squander everything and he'd realize it was better at home than all these horrible choices that I've made. Why didn't I just listen to him to begin with? Why did I go against him? And he would go home to beg his father, Father, I, I, I'm unworthy to be a son. I've done wrong. I know I've done wrong. Just make me a servant, right? Let me work for you as opposed to how I'm living out there. And the father's response was no. No told you, and I told you what it would be like, and I am just, and you didn't listen, so no. So here's Jesus, and he's telling this story, and they're like, yeah, we've heard this one before, right? And he gets to that part of the story, and they're waiting to hear just how just God is, and that you're going to get what you deserve for what you do in this life. And then all of a sudden, Jesus talks about this, this, this man who'd been wearing a robe, and, and in order to run in these, what they'd have to do is they'd have to hike him up. And it was disgraceful to hike him up and show your legs, and he'd have to be running out there, humiliating himself over a son who's disgusting. I mean, he's been living with pigs. It, it, actually, the, the, the words here, it says in uh, Luke 15, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The Greek verb there indicates not just and kissed him. The Greek verb indicates and smothered him with kisses and just kept on kissing him. He is embracing him and he is exhilarated that his son has come home. That is a totally different response than the people expected. It's one thing to believe in God. It's another thing to know him. That's why Jesus came. 
And that's why Jesus taught. He was like, you guys, you know about God, but you don't know him. So let me live among you. Let me teach you who he is. I want you to know him because you know me. I want you to know him through the way I live. I want you to know him through the stories I tell. Like that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to take these people that know about God and have uh, misconceptions of God and have heard things, and he's like, let me make my father known to you. He says, listen, when you worship, you worship God who is hurt by our rebellion but runs to us when we return. He's hurt by our rebellion and runs to us while we return. Uh, standing in back during worship and they were singing and they said, hallelujah, it blows my mind how you love me. And I thought, it is not possible to sing those words if we just know about God. It's just not possible. But when we know him, and we know that he grieves for us, we know that he's angered at us. We know that he is angered at any atrocity that happens against us. And we know that when we turn to him, He's not just sitting back waiting. He, he, is, he is God who runs to us. We can say, that blows my mind how you love me. But we have to know him. And finally, we worship God who restores us when we repent. He restores us when we repent. Luke 15, 21 to 32, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Literally, he just said this is what he was going to say right? Been playing it through his head. Okay, when I get back, when I see my dad, this is what I'm going to say to him, and he's rehearsing, 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 and he gets there, and then he repents, right? What he's been, this, this is what my dad needs to know, and he repents, but the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate, and then he adds this last little part, for all the Pharisees that were present in judging him. And he says, Now his older son, you Pharisees, was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because it rece received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. But you never gave me a young goat, and I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This reminds me of a handful of weeks ago when we talked about how sometimes we get confused on where life is better, right? And we think, man, I could have been hanging out in the marketplace and doing reckless living and came into the field at the last minute and worked and still got what everyone else did. No, because it's way better in the field. It is so much better in the Father's house, and that's what he's saying. Like, you were here. You got to have this the whole time. So when the man comes to his senses, and he comes home, and he rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed, and this is what he says, I've sinned against heaven, right? Yeah. You have. You've sinned against God. All sin is against God. So there's a confession of sin to God, and I have sinned before you, right again. I think one of the hardest things for us to do is to swallow our pride and say, man, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? And then he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father, for lack of better words, is like, shut up. Stop right there. He doesn't even entertain it. He doesn't entertain it. He doesn't justify it. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. See, the son believed that his sonship was based on his actions. And God's like, your sonship's not based on your actions. Your sonship is based on my actions. Your sonship is based on my declaration, not your actions. And guess what? I still declare you son. So we see repent and then full restoration. I like how... Peter says it in Acts 3.19. He's giving the uh, sermon at Pentecost. He says, Repent therefore and turn back, 
that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Repentance leads to refreshing. Repentance leads to restoration because God is good. Because he's good. So we worship God who is hurt by our sin, yet still allows us to choose, who runs when we return to him and who restores us when we repent. So the question would have to be then, where, where are you today? Right? I, I th- and I think there's different places you're going to find yourself in. I think there are some who genuinely have just blatantly chose, uh, you know, I choose to go against God. And each day I'll make another choice and another choice and another choice to go against his will. And you might find that you have been wandering away from him in need of repentance. And maybe there's some that you're just not sure where you're at with God at all. Because you don't know him. And maybe you know about him, but you, you don't know him and who he is. I like how Jesus describes it in 17.3. He says, this is eternal life, that they know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So many people are like, man, I want eternal life. Okay. Well, this is eternal life, that we know God, that we know God, that we know him, who he is, and all of his attributes. So I encourage you, if that's where you're at, to continue pursuing. But then there's the other part of it, and that's the part where we, every week, every week, We say, you are a missionary. I think sometimes we forget that we serve a God on that mission. We were literally sent into the world as missionaries, ministers of reconciliation, right? Which means that God is grieving and angry. Grieving and he's angry. And when we look out at our neighbors and our friends and complete strangers into all different parts of the world, that there are people that God is grieving the choices that they're making and he is angry at the choices that they are making. And then he has sent us to go. And as we said last week, I mean, there's kind of three ways that we can be presented with that. One is to just be neglectful, to say, God, I know that you're grieving and you're angry when these things going, are going on, but send somebody else. God, I'm too busy. God, I got too much going on. And we can just neglect the fact that there are so many hurting people out there. We can neglect the fact that if we can lead them to know God and then they turn to him, that we will have a rejoicing God running to them on the return. Some we can just choose to blatantly say, hmm, God, I reject that and I'm not going to do that. I have other things I'd rather focus on than leading people to know you. I guess the plea is, is that we will faithfully say, okay, God, I'm going to use my kids as an example. There is one thing that my kids can accomplish every day, and I can only choose one that they can accomplish every day. Then it is my prayer that they know God just a little bit more. If all else fails, right, if everything else happens around them and they, they don't learn anything in school that day and they don't learn anything from me about sports that, that day. What a pity. If they can know God just a little bit more every day, it's good to go. Which then leads me to say, what am I doing so that the people around me can know God just a little bit more every day? I don't have to know everything. I don't have to solve everything. I don't have to do everything. But if they can know God, not not about him, if they can know him just a little bit more every day, 
What am I doing to live faithfully like that? Let's pray. God, we love you. You are so good. God, there's, there's not a single one of us that can sit here and say that we, we, don't, we don't identify with the prodigal son. There's not a single one of us that can stand in your presence and say that all of our choices have been good. There's not a single one of us that can look you in the eye and say that we've never betrayed you, abandoned you, intentionally went against you. But God, every single one of us, you've given us the ability to choose not just those choices, God, but to choose you now, Lord, in our life. And God, we praise you because it blows our mind how you love us. It shocks us to the core when we know you. And we recognize the, the profound, deep love that you have for us. And God, I just pray that we know that. But I pray that we can lead everybody else around us to know that too. God, we just love you so much. We just pray in your son's name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. My name is Harold Seacrest, and I'm one of the elders here, and it's time for our communion. You know, when we take communion, our hearts kneel at the foot of the cross. And when we give ourselves fully to Christ, we see the greatest act of love that the world will ever know. And when we give thanks for the forgiveness of our sins, we love to hear the words of our Lord as he said to the disciples, take and eat, this is my body. And he took the cup saying, this is my blood of the covenant that was shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. So as we take the cup this morning, just thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul for dying on the cross to save us from our sins. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for dying on the cross to save us from our sins. We thank you for your many blessings. And I just lift up our entire church family to you today and ask you to be with them and bless them throughout the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Bill Galloway, and uh, we've come to the time of our service when we present different budget line items that are supported by the offerings that are collected each Sunday. Today, I'd like to cover a few details of the uh, coffee shop operation. I currently have oversight of the coffee shop, which basically means that if the coffee is cold, or if it tastes bad, or we're out, it's my fault. For those of you that may not have noticed, in the southwest corner of the foyer, we have a small area that is used to make coffee. We provide regular and decaffeinated coffee as, a, as well as uh, an assortment of teas. We do have a machine that used to make hot chocolate and cappuccino, but the machine has not functioned for quite some time. I, I have on several occasions attempted to make repairs, but unfortunately have been unsuccessful so far. Uh, we also provide uh, bottled water on request, as well as uh, some sweet uh, peppermint candy that I enjoy on a regular basis. Uh, I would like to take uh, this opportunity to recognize someone who uh, has been very faithful and diligent in preparing coffee on Sunday mornings with uh, with very few misses, uh, Mary Hera 
is uh, very dedicated to coming in early on a Sunday morning and uh, preparing uh, the caffeine that keeps many of you awake and puts you in a cheerful and upbeat demeanor that we all enjoy. Thank you, Mary, and please keep up the great work. Areas that the coffee shop could use some help in would include the following. Uh, we have a large uh, black uh, dry erase board that uh, we've, we've done in the past some different artwork, but it's been blank for quite some time now. So if there's anyone that's interested in uh, adding some color to the, that corner of the foyer, please let me know. Uh, we also could use some help with light cleanup after the service. We have some people that, uh, that fill in that area right now, but uh, if you would be interested in, in helping in that arena, uh, if you could also uh, contact me and we can maybe put a little schedule together, spread that work out a little bit. So this is, uh, this is not a, uh, a large budget line item, uh, really kind of small, but, uh, but I think it's something that most of us enjoy and, uh, and like to, uh, to keep it as friendly and uh, inviting as we can. <coughs> it's, uh, it's part of what the offerings uh, pay, pay for here and, uh, and I just want to uh, explain it so you understand it a little better. In uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, each of, a, each of you should give as you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. All right, let's pray. Lord, you know each of our hearts. You know when and where we struggle. Please individually open our eyes and see the true blessing that you have given each of us. Open our eyes to the needs around us and give us your generous spirit as we consider gifts and offerings that are presented in your name. Give each of us your vision for the impact that this ministry could have in the community around us and give each of us a steadfast resolve to be an active part in completing your plan for Fox Valley Christian Church. Amen. Men, you're invited to join us for great fellowship and a delicious breakfast on Saturday, September 28th at 8.30 a.m. Please RSVP to men's ministry at fecc.com so we know you're coming. Mark your calendars for Sunday, September 29th. Our children's ministry is taking over and kids will be serving in all areas of the worship service. We'll also be collecting a noisy offering for Operation Christmas Child, so don't forget to bring your loose chain. Throughout September, we're collecting electronic toys that can be adapted for special needs students in local elementary schools. For more information, check out the poster at the Information Center or contact Jaden LaGrange. Encore Generation will meet on Saturday, October 5th at noon here at FBCC. Join us for a potluck lunch followed by a hymn sing. Please sign up at the Information Center to let us know you're coming. Join us for our next prayer and share on Saturday, October 5th at 2 p.m. here at FBCC. Everyone is welcome for a time of caring, encouragement, and connection. For questions, email prayerandshare at fbcc.com. Join us for a Portillo's fundraiser on Tuesday, October 8th from 5 to 8 p.m. at the Batavia Portillo's. You can dine in, use the drive-thru, or pick up curbside. Just present a flyer or use the code PORTILLOS22 for FVCC to receive credit. All proceeds will support the FVCC Scholarship Fund. Invite your family and friends, and let's make it a night to remember. Flyers are available in the lobby. Element students, get ready for a fun-filled fall outing at Sunny Acres Farm on Sunday, October 20th. You'll enjoy rides, snacks, photo ops, and even take home a free pumpkin. Don't miss this chance to experience all the fun of the season. Bring your friends and register online by October 18th. Grace Marriage is a program designed to strengthen and equip couples to build marriages that reflect God's grace. Our new series kicks off this fall with quarterly meetings starting Saturday, October 26th from 4 to 8 p.m. Register today to invest in your marriage. For more information, contact Brent and Barbara Fields. FECC has registered for the 2024 International Conference on Missions happening November 14th through the 16th in Lexington, Kentucky. 
We encourage everyone, adults, students, and children to attend and learn more about missions and how to get involved. Our church registration covers all costs for anyone from FBCC to attend, either in person or virtually. Check the bulletin for registration codes. For more information on these upcoming events, please visit bulletin.fbcc.com.